Hey, this is Steve in Dallas, Texas. It's Saturday morning, my friend, and you are listening to Light Talk. Good morning. This is Zach coming to you from Washington, D.C. And today, by special request, we are discussing all things extended reality on Light Talk. And this is Ellen coming to you from the beautiful beaches of St. Bart. And if you don't already know, you are listening to Light Talk. And we are the Lumen Brothers and Sista. Welcome, everyone, to episode 247. Uh, Shall we go right into the news? Okay. One of the things I think we should talk about today is what's happening on Broadway and what's happening in entertainment in general with more closed downs. What do you hear about what's going on out there, guys? Well, I think since we talked last, the Radio City Christmas show has actually decided to cancel all remaining performances. And uh, while it does sound kind of scary, I think that it's really an important precaution to be taking. One of the things to think about, at least in terms of Radio City, is if all performers who are testing positive have to take, uh, you know, a 10 day quarantine, that's basically the rest of the run of the the Christmas show. So it wouldn't make sense. You know, Radio City Rockettes, uh, there, there are no understudies the way they are on Broadway for performers. So I think this was uh, an unfortunate but smart call to postpone that show for till next year to see what happens. Um, but for Broadway, it's it's a really big challenge because it you know much like the Christmas show, there's a trickle down effect where you have uh, you know actors who have understudies that can go on for them, but when a show closes down, has to close down, uh, you know there's hundreds of people that that are now not working and maybe not getting paid during that time. Right, which is terrible at the holiday season. Well, I think Actors' Equity has just sent out, along with CDC, new guidelines to the theaters. I, I saw a blurb in the newspaper here yesterday that the Dallas Theater Center and their production of Christmas mm-hmm. Carol, which is a, a huge moneymaker for them, uh, has shut down for one day while they are assessing the equity and CDC guidelines. But they're hoping to be back up today we're recording this on a tuesday so they're hoping to be back up on a tuesday or a wednesday don't uh, break the illusion that it's live on saturday <laughs> oh i mean uh saturday yeah i mean it's interesting <laughs> like we were talking earlier that it trickles down not just to broadway but in all forms of entertainment including sports you know that you end up having uh your a-list performer or your A-list athlete that's not available to play for reasons, you know, related to COVID. And then you get to the B string or the, the C or, you know, the, the, the rookies and the minor leaguers who may not be as skilled or prepared, or uh, they're not TV stars in the same way that, you know, some of these athletes are. And you start to see like the NHL, which has decided to take a hiatus instead of, going with games with lesser known players or teams that are undermanned and stuff like that. Well, I was watching the train wreck, which was called the Chicago Bears football game yesterday. And it was interesting. There was one man in the uh, stadium holding a sign that said, I don't have COVID. Can I play? <laughs> but the, the, the Bears started that game. If, if memory serves me right, they were down 14 starters wow. and they were down three coaches. Uh, I believe they said they worked out one day and then it was just trying to figure out how to get through the game um, on Sunday. It seems to me if that's the case, you just don't play. Right. The good news is, uh, you know, especially in the case of Broadway, that all these performers are all fully vaccinated and that no one is going to get, you know, horribly sick, hopefully knock on wood uh, because of that, you know, that that it's it's a huge nuisance, you know, but I'm starting to look at it like it's even for my own family, like it's like strep throat, you know, when it's going around, uh, when you first get strep throat, you have to quarantine yourself when you get on the medication. And then once it kicks in, you can go back to your business. And uh, I'm hoping that that with all the vaccinations and the booster shots and all that other business that's happening, that that's what this is going to be like. You know, in France until now, if you were not vaccinated, 
you could use a test, a uh, negative test result to go almost any place. Mm-hmm. And now they're changing that in January and it's going to be a vaccine pass to go almost everywhere. Wow. Um, so mm-hmm. I don't know if the United States is going to yeah. do the same thing or not, but it is kind of scary that you can travel five hours in an airplane from say Philadelphia to Vegas, like one might do for LDI and people were not tested or vaxxed. So, you know, I think there's right. some loopholes in the, um, prevention. Well, I was reading yesterday, the CDC had yeah. released that eight out of 10 cases right now are taking seed in those folks who are not vaccinated. Right. So it's, you know, if, if you're vaccinated, you're going to get sick, but it's unlikely you're going to get deathly sick. Well, I guess that's the good news. The, the scary thing is, you know, like Broadway and the concert right. uh, touring at the spring concerts, and summer tours and big festivals get canceled again. It's a real economic hit for the industry uh, without, you know. And it's hard because especially for things that tour, you know, the the rules are different in every state and in some cases in different cities. And so, you know, it's hard to to navigate that. You know, you, you might per- be performing in a city where you're not allowed to have a mask mandate at your arena right. uh, or you're not allowed to check for, uh, you know, uh, your vaccination status, wink, wink, Florida. Um, <laughs> anyway, so, so that definitely makes things challenging. And then you have artists who say, well, if they're going to say we can't ask, then we're not going to play there. Um, you know, I know that was actually something that uh, Billie Eilish went through where she didn't want to perform in certain places for political reasons, but then she also felt like it's not fair for me to do that to my fans who are politically aligned with me right. uh, to, to, to deny them the show basically because of what people that they may not have voted for have decided for them. So it's challenging, but hopefully, you know, it's just a, blip in time and in a couple of weeks we'll be on the we'll we'll know more and be we'll on, be the, on the other side of this maybe yeah well the sound of those rabid ducks means it's time for let's talk about and that's right today we have a special episode all about xr stages okay so zach what is an xr an stage? xr stage so xr <laughs> is the abbreviation for extended reality you know there's augmented reality or ar which is uh using a like for example a camera phone where you see what's actually in front of you but there's additional layer of digital things on top of that there's virtual reality or vr which is uh, when you see somebody wearing a headset or goggles of some kind where the, instead of seeing what's in front of them, they're seeing a completely simulated world in the goggles. And now there's extended reality, which is kind of a hybrid of all these things. And an extended reality stage is a specialized filming environment where uh, there's usually at least three sides uh of an LED screen of some sort, and the floor is an LED screen of some sort. Uh, your your performer is within a digitally created environment, and the content that's on those screens is synchronized with the camera, and the camera is aware of where it is perspective-wise and position-wise, so that as the camera moves throughout the space, the perspective changes, and you can have a performer uh, performing live in a fully digital environment that appears to uh, move and envelop them in real time as if they were actually there. So some of the ones I've seen, like the Katy Perry Daisies song that was sort of the first benchmark for this, the graphics are kind of, um, you know, like a comic strip in a way. They're they're animated, brightly colored, um, not looking for photographic reality. So how do you decide the content you're going to put on these video walls? Well, I think that that's really sort of a creative direction type thing. You know, for that, it the it the content was indeed that kind of like comic style, because I think that went with the lyrics of the song Mm -hmm. and the kind of performance it was. And it went with her costume and her choreography so that there were opportunities for her to be in front of the content or behind the content so that she felt really like it was really immersive. Um, but then you have other things like uh, 
that that show, The Mandalorian on Disney Plus, where the entire show is shot in that extended reality environment. And one of the things that is interestingly achievable in this extended reality environment for something like The Mandalorian is that you kind of get a bit of practical lighting the, off of the walls. So as things move and things reflect, you get the color of what that content actually is reflecting on the performer. And that way the performer has a more sort of natural illumination. You don't need to use lights to simulate uh, what their environment would look like casting shadows on them or, you know, the color temperature on them uh, because it's coming from that actual content. But I think a lot of it comes down to just what your what the story you want to tell is and how you want to create that environment. So do all projects lend themselves to XR? And if not, what do you tell your client when they come in and say, oh, we want to do this on an XR stage and you look at it and you go, yeah, no, I don't think so. I mean, I think that that's sort of, you know, that's a, a question that I've been answering for 20 years when people say we want to have projections. And I say, well, you don't really need projections. You know, your story takes place in a living room and you might be better off having a living room with like a real couch and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So we can have a human relation and interaction. Um, I think that uh, in... In some ways, it seems the people who are reaching out for this kind of content usually are more aware that this is what is the solution they need. One of the things that's also good about this, uh, which I think was one of the reasons they did it for the Katy Perry thing in general, you know, at the time she was pregnant, there still hadn't wasn't a vaccine for COVID and they were very concerned about uh, having a minim as minimal a crew as possible. And that by not having any scenery and just having a camera operator, someone who's operating the LED screens, you can have a very small crew of people that at that time could be very socially distanced. You know, there was testing and stuff like that. Um, but that it requires a lot less people than you would on a traditional soundstage, you know, with a full set. So if Katy Perry is at home, can you sort of teleport her in or does she have to be on this stage? Uh, you have to be on the stage in order for this to work. Uh, I mean, in many ways, this is like an offshoot of the technology that like George Lucas created for Return of the Jedi, which was the motion control camera. Because what it is, is you have this setup that is controllable. It's controlled by a computer system that allows you to repeat things over and over again. And it's always precise and it's always identical so that you can continue to add layers to it uh, digitally. Uh, in fact, in the Return of the Jedi days, it was adding layers to it optically, which is also why you needed it to always line up that they could make the camera film something 15 times in a row and it would always be exactly the same. Um, so in this, in this scenario, uh, you know, you have your environment that the performers standing inside of, so to speak, because they're usually in some kind of cube type thing that has video on each wall. And then the camera is constantly talking to the backgrounds to let it know what direction it's facing, what it sees, uh, where it's moving, how it's moving, so that you can always adjust the perspective to keep it looking realistic. So really, if you were to look on the media server, that is creating all the backgrounds in the XR environment, you'd see they've created like an entire world. And when I say that it sounds like a video game in some ways, the reality is these, many of this artwork, a lot of this artwork is created in gaming engines like Unreal, you know? So they're creating an entire world uh, might, like you might do for Fortnite or World of Warcraft or some other game. Uh, and then you're choosing to, show a slice of that world in your XR environment, but the camera knows when it moves around that it can pan around into this entire world and it's the worlds can be as simple or as complex as you design them. Uh, so it's really... Right, and then there's that Travis Scott event, which was sort of a hybrid where the gamers sort of stopped gaming for a minute and he came in and did a live set right. in the middle of the game. Right. Yeah, there was. And they sold, you know, like 12 million tickets for $10. Yeah. I mean, part of that, what's interesting about it with the gaming stuff is that they're the, the, the whole economy part of it is already built in, you know, through the gaming stuff. They already have all the in app purchasing set up and all that other stuff. So for them to 
have a live show and have tickets for it. It's all already the stru- the infrastructure is already there. So that's a really right. easy thing. The hardest part is probably, you know, getting renting the space. Well, you're also going to get a lot. If you go back to Mandalorian again, you're going to get a lot better performances from the actors also. I mean, you know, chroma key hasn't changed since it right. came out. So no more of this uh, actor standing there on a, a set talking to a, a, a tennis ball on a stick. They're, they right. are in their environment. Uh, you know, all of a sudden they can, they can keep that camera in the same place and just flip the scene around and reverse the shooting angle without, within seconds. I was reading one of the uh, big benefits of this technology in Mandalorian is that the uh, director says they are shooting, on average, an extra 40 pages of script a day. Wow. And it's, wow. It's, it's, not a, it, it's not drudgery. No one is dreading it. It's just it is so much cleaner and faster. And their prep work, they know everything that set's capable of doing before they walk on it and start shooting. So there's right. not a lot of discoveries being made. Right. Yeah. I mean, it, it's in, in many ways for a lot of scenarios, I think it's definitely the future and definitely uh, has so many more benefits than shortcomings that it's totally worth it. You know, I know that a lot of movies, especially like, now that everybody loves these big Hollywood special effects, you know, comic book movies, it's perfect for those kind of movies. But it's also perfect. You know, it's going to be perfect for just shooting you in your apartment also, though. I mean, that's the next step is it doesn't have to be science fiction. It can be anything. Right, and you, right. you, don't have to, yeah. you don't have to pack up and travel around the world to get to a location. That's true. Well, that's what we were just talking about. How about touring? Can you send something out on the road where the musicians are at home, but they look like they're in a staged environment? Well, I mean, you're getting dangerously close to the Tupac hologram or the Tupac Pepper's right. ghost, really. Right. Because <laughs> um, so, holograms don't exist. Right. <laughs> so in theory, uh, I think you can. I mean, this is this is definitely, especially as a projection designer, uh, I'm always sort of questioning um, how much digital content can I add to the uh, to the live event before it no longer feels like a live event that I'm at in person. So, Zach, can you can you address the uh, this issue of uh, what Ellen is talking about in relationship to? Uh, the XR for a camera, and then all of a sudden for a human eye, and there's 30,000 people sitting there trying to watch sure. it at well, an arena. Yeah, I mean, the trick there is because it's all about controlling the perspective and and the audience at a concert, you know, and in theory, you're all seated, uh, even though we know you're all standing, um, that you're, you have a single perspective. You're looking at the stage from one direction from wherever you're sitting, and what you see is just from that perspective. And it may be from the side, you might be in a box, you might be in the, in the audience, like in the orchestra section. But the idea behind the extended reality type stuff is that by having controlled synchronous perspective between the camera and the backgrounds, you're able to move things around in a way that feels natural and naturally simulate movement. Um, So in some ways, I can imagine that like in a theme park, they might be able to take that kind of technology where you're in a ride vehicle that is already moving and has the ability to control what perspective you see things at. You know, that's why like in the Haunted Mansion, the Pepper's Ghost effects work so well at Disney World because they're controlling what direction you look at it from. If you were just looking at it uh, from, you know, the side, it may not have as strong and crisp an appearance. Uh, and so, in a in a way, I think that that's a challenge for a live performance uh, to recreate that kind of thing, because you only have one direction to look at. Yeah, but you know, it's funny because if you go to a Rolling Stones concert, about ninety percent of the people are looking at the iMag anyway. That's true. Um, the fact that there's a live performer on the stage is almost irrelevant. It could be anybody. Um, so, in a way, Mick could be at home. And what you're seeing on the iMag is some XR version of something. Um, 
even if it's like some really weird music videos or who knows. Um, I think well, there's I something have, to this. We'll have to worry about stuff in the future, like that. But, yeah, I mean, there's yeah. there's all, there's a lot of shows where you know some shows the iMag is just straight up, you know, bigger version of Bruce Springsteen or the Rolling Stones or whomever. Uh, I went to a what was it Justin Timberlake Jay Z concert, and the the iMag was really well integrated and they like weaved in and out of music video content and right. original right. content and they didn't try to like hide the fact that the iMag was iMag. But it just became an element in the video show, right. so to speak. You know, it's funny because I always think back to Josh White telling us um, back at the Fillmore that the Bill Graham was like, you know, some of these performers are really boring. We need something on the screen that's more interesting <laughs> to look at. That's funny. So all of this XR stuff happens because we were at a technological crossroad where like real time rendering was possible. So what is the hardware and software that does that? Uh, well, uh, you know, I, I, as I said earlier, I think a lot of the back end of this is coming from the video game world, you know, mm -hmm. where you would create these worlds, and I'm making finger quotes here, uh, you know, like for uh, fantasy adventure uh, games, where you needed to create like an entire island that had all kinds of things on this island it had to have trees, it had to have fields, it had to have other, you know, non player characters, uh, it had to be inhabited, you had to be able to explore it. So I had, a, you know, like they say now, like the world of Minecraft is the equivalent of 9 million times the size of Earth is how much world has been developed out in in the ether. Um, and that, uh, in these games, uh, the player playing the game is the camera. You know, you, how, what you see as you move through those worlds is the camera. And some very, very smart people figured out that we could adapt this using media servers like Disguise and, and combining that with things like the Unreal Engine uh, to uh, make the camera an actual camera. You know, we, we deal all the time in the previous world with these idea, the idea of these simulated cameras. So this was just like, what if we made the simulated camera an actual camera? And we are able to then use the real camera, which is reporting where it is in the space to the Unreal Engine to navigate through those worlds. Uh, you know, and there's some parts of it that can be driven by the media server. Some parts of it are driven by where the camera is in the physical space. Um, but a lot of this is really all come from video game world. And the camera tracking systems, the cameras are actually moving. Uh, yeah, in most cases they are. And, and they report, they have, you know, they report back their X, Y, and Z coordinates to the media server. So it knows where the camera is in order to adjust the perspective of the content. Now, is there an ethical side of this, like news, you know, like, hi, I'm Zach Borave, you know, reporting live from Afghanistan, except you're not. Uh, I mean. I suppose there could be. Uh, I think uh, there's the new Matrix movie that comes out tomorrow is supposed to have, or I guess when when this comes out on Saturday, it will have come out a few days before. Uh, the the, the Matrix again. movie that comes out on Wednesday, December 22nd, is supposed to have extensive use of the most sophisticated Unreal Engine rendered uh, scenery and characters that have been seen before. And... You know, there was an article, I think, in Entertainment Weekly where they showed a CG Keanu Reeves that was like far superior to anything I've seen on like a, on a Sony PS5 or an Xbox. Um, so part of the ethicalness of this may also be not just seeing me in an environment that I'm not actually in, but seeing a human being who's not actually there being portrayed as if they were. Right. Right. Interesting. It's all very interesting. So what's next? You know, what, where do we go after this? Uh, well, I mean, these things are all cyclical, right? So after this, we're going to go back to like, somebody's going to rediscover film and they're going to say, it's this amazing thing with rich saturation <laughs> and colors. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure. I mean, I think that what, what really seems to happen is that this technology that costs millions of dollars 
then in five years cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. And then in another five years cost $10,000. And I'd love to see like, you know, it becomes so affordable that schools can start to have these studios and that, you know, they will be the iMovie version of some of this stuff so that like all students can start learning how to play around with these things. Cause I think that right. the reality of it is <clears throat> it's all just going to hopefully lead to better storytelling. You know, the, right. the easier and more affordable we can make the tools, then hopefully the more barriers we're removing to help uh, everyone tell their stories. Yeah, it's interesting, too, because during the lockdown, when concerts and theater and everything was shuttered, a lot of our good friends like at World Stage and Four Wall and PRG, they've all gotten into this, uh, right. the XR stages, and they all have them. Uh, Solo Tech apparently just partnered with someone on some XR stages. So clearly they feel that there's a future in this. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think there definitely is. Um, I think that uh, it's not going to take over live entertainment, really, but that it's going to hopefully create like a new uh, niche market that can flourish. I mean, there's definitely really great uses where you can, you know, do a corporate event. And while it may be unethical for me to, or unethical, I should say, uh, for me to pretend that I'm reporting live from Afghanistan, there's no reason why, you know, if I'm the head of a uh, of a fortune 500 company that I can't have a VR stage as the place where I'm reporting live from to all my employees over zoom, you know, right. something like that. I couldn't track down who it was, but someone just did a, a major fashion show this okay. way. Yeah. That's one, one of the big houses. Yep. And there's now apparently the Koreans have two uh, television shows that are completely shot sure. this way. 100%. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the thing that's interesting about it, like the Katy Perry thing was live. All this other stuff we've been talking about is not live. So even though it's captured live, it's still edited and they tweak it and play around with it. But there's a lot of potential for this to help in like the live world. So it may seem like awfully high tech for a like a sitcom, but it could totally work. Right. Well, it also, in a way, you know, that there's that old, you know, for years, people have probably been saying to you, oh, I want projections so I don't have to tour a big set. Right. Um, and can can this sort of XR world replace 2D scenery on yeah. the Broadway stage? Yeah, I mean, it's well, I mean, look what the Rolling Stones go out with and Tina Turner and, you know, all those huge tours, U2 and Nine Inch Nails, and they're taking 27 trucks. Right. If they could take a couple of roll up video walls, it might be a different world. It's true. It's true. Um, you know, it's interesting because in some ways, too, this is like not that different than all of the projection stuff that, you know, Hitchcock used to do when you would see in those old movies and the people are driving in a car and the scenery is going past them. And that was just a projection screen with a film of the perspective out the window of the car. Uh, you know, so this is a very fancy high tech version of that. Right. And the fact that we have all the visual special effects we have, if we don't like what's behind the car, you right. can change it. Right. He couldn't. Once it was done, it was done. Exactly. Interesting. Now, what about the other option of augmented reality where uh, you said before about like an extra layer that's in your phone or in your mm -hmm. iPad and you download an app and you hold it up at a certain time during a concert and you get extra layers of visual? Yeah, I think that. That's a, a really interesting thing to me, you know, that idea, because there's uh, so many different ways that it can be used, you know, from uh, like uh, there was this show that used to be on VH1 called Pop Up Video that I loved, where throughout they would show music videos and these little bubbles would pop up and give you extra information about what was happening, like when they filmed the video, when the guy wrote the song, mm -hmm. stuff like that. So the idea of having that ability to like... um you know, go, let's say I want to go to uh, downtown Dallas and I want to learn about the the historic uh, buildings down there. If I can hold up my phone and, you know, see an extra bit of information on the screen of my phone, it, it's like an excellent tool for that, you know, for museums to be able to have that to do a guided or assisted uh, tour like that uh, at a concert to get more information like that, or even to use it like you could be watching something and then like you you like the shirt that the person's wearing you can click on it and buy that shirt 
you know, stuff like that. Oh, that's scary. <laughs> but it's it's out there. Yep. You know, or you could have your nutcracker tree grow through augmented sure, reality, yeah. even though it's not really growing on stage or you right. know. I mean, there's so many times where I've uh, gotten called in to help create what we call an Instagrammable moment, but it's almost like you can use it to reverse engineer that. So I can create a picture of myself with a digital version of somebody else in the augmented reality screen, as opposed to like, you know, creating a, a place where the two of us can go and take a picture. You know, there's all these like really fun apps where like you can have a pet tiger sitting on your shoulder and things like that. Right. But like, <laughs> you know, even th like what I was saying before, now you can get these things for free on your iPhone. Whereas five years ago, you needed pretty sophisticated technology to achieve these things. Right. Do you, do you think we're not going to recognize entertainment in, I don't know, 20 years? Do I think we're not going to recognize entertainment? Well, I don't know. I'm, a, you know, a bit of a naysayer about live events. And I think that eventually the kids who grew up on iPhones are not going to want to go any place and buy tickets and park their car and eat lousy food and, you know, smells of beer and where's the restroom and, you know. Um, well, if you're a performer, if you can, if you can really sell 12 million tickets for a five minute song in the middle of a gaming competition for right. $10 a pop. Right. You know, there, there is something to be said for just, uh, I don't want to tour anymore. Right. I think one of the things that I've noticed that I think is happening is that, um, you know, this is, this is where we need David to talk about the dopamine hit you get from playing on your phone that I think that I've seen like, uh, with some of the immersive theater that has evolved in the last few years, especially in like the Halloween haunt world, that I think that because of all this entertainment that is available to us virtually and digitally, that some people are, they need like a bigger, more impactful, higher sensory experience when they have a live experience because they're like, I can already do that on my phone. You know, when I go out, I, I need someone to scare the hell out of me because I'm not scared at, like that when I look at a scary thing on my phone. You know, I need that haunt to, I need people to jump out and scare me. So I think that in some ways, while in some worlds we're looking at creating more low sensory experiences for kids who have issues with that, that we're also starting to create these higher sensory experiences that are like immersive theater where, you know, there's an additional layer of smell and touch that there's not when you go see the Nutcracker at the ballet. Right. Well, I thought that was one of the things that was disappointing about the Van Gogh immersive experience. No smell? You know, if you've, if, if you've, well, if you've never seen a projector being used, I guess you were kind of wowed by it. But, you know, having, you know, been around the block once or twice, I went to see it and it was nice, but it was nothing that, you know, we haven't been doing in the business for the last 20 right. years. I mean, I can tell you, like, my mother's experience was like for her, the difference, I guess, is she was on the stage. <laughs> You know, you're in the painting, so mm -hmm. you're in the right, projection. That's the point. Right. Yep. Being immersive, the real immersive right. side of but, that. Uh, but otherwise, technically, it's not anything all that new. Um, you know, just like how we jokingly say that Pepper's Ghost is not a hologram, but Pepper's Ghost has got to be almost 200 years old now. Right. What well, Civil War, I think. Right. So I think that that's well, part of it. Yeah. Right. You talked about the uh, Pepper's Ghost effect at the uh, Haunted Mansion. And it really, really is a beautiful effect for anybody that hasn't seen it. It's um, a dining room uh, situation, the set. Um, and one of the nice things, and that is a huge gingerbread, I think, regular 2D, huge gingerbread house on one of the tables. And then there's these couples, couple, one couple, two couples dancing around the right. room, and they are the Pepper's Ghost. And it's just so beautiful and so ethereal. And you, you really do wonder. You know, people that don't know what it is really sort of do wonder. They have some other interesting projection things in there, too, um, like yeah. the fortune teller's head that talks to you. And um, right. there's She's a lot a of Pepper's interesting ghost. stuff going on and, in there. And then also there's those singing busts, which are uh, most people agree are the first instance of uh, projection mapping that was, was ever done, was projecting right. the faces onto those busts, which have no facial features on their own. Right. And yeah. that's been around quite a while already. So Disney was really in the forefront yeah. of that, too. 1969. 
You are listening to Light Talk, and now, a Christmas story. So this is my Christmas story that I call One Dead Mouse. Some years ago, I was asked to design a new Nutcracker. The design team spent about three months going back and forth on ideas for the production. We finally agreed upon a regionally specific design, something the whole city could recognize as its own. Oddly, one area that was difficult to settle were the costumes to be worn in the mouse war. After much conversation, we decided that the final mouse look would include a beautifully carved mouse head with brown leather ears, uh, much like a knight's helmet. The headpiece completely covered the head. We even scrimmed and dyed the eye openings. The mouse corps de ballet of nine and ten-year-olds looked pretty darn good on stage. During the mouse ballet, the mice would move in geometric patterns, much like a marching band, only at the speed of light, dashing in and out of the wings on diagonals and a mad dash from upstage to downstage only to cut left or right at the proscenium line, mere feet from the orchestra pit, which, of course, held the orchestra. Weeks of rehearsal passed. The technicals and dress rehearsals came and went without a stumble. Before we knew it, opening night had arrived. The mouse war began, and the wonderfully choreographed chaos filled the stage. The mice were absolutely amazing in their precision. Proud parents were beaming. Grandparents were crying and snapping photographs. And backstage, the stagehands were slapping the choreographer on the back and saying, Well done, old man. Which brings me back to the aforementioned dramatic dash downstage. You remember, single file to the pit at the speed of light, only to turn away from disaster at the last possible moment, while wearing a full head covering with scrimmed eyes. On opening night, that cursed night, one little mouse took a few steps too many and flew mid-air, legs churning into the pit and disappeared into the void. A gasp could be heard from the audience whilst the pit played on. The other mice dashed around the stage unaware of their missing sister. What seemed to be an eternity, but was probably only seconds, ended when we saw a petite mouse hand grasping at the apron, followed by a little mouse foot in pink point shoes. Then, like Lazarus rising from the dead, a full mouse emerged, two hands supporting her backside, lifting her gently onto the stage whilst the pit played on. Safely back on stage, she raised her little mouse helmet to get her bearings, lowered it back into place and rejoined her mouse sisters to the roars and cheers and applause whilst the band played on that Christmas Eve. And that, my friends, is the story of one dead mouse. And I hope you have a happy holiday. <laughs> Very nice. Well, the rocking sounds of the Luminoids tells us that once again you've spent another morning listening to Light Talk. You can hear our show on Spotify, iTunes, Google, YouTube, LiveDesignOnline.com, Amazon Prime Music, and just about every podcast site out there. Check out our website on lighttalk.org for future guests, and be sure to follow us on Facebook and subscribe to our podcast. That way you will not miss a second of Light Talk Insanity. No guarantee is offered regarding the accuracy of any statements or opinions made on this podcast. However, if you do decide to litigate the law firm of Fleck, Block, Blair, and Blair, and their paralegal snoot will defend us until our retirement funds are depleted. Light Talk is written and produced by the Lumen Brothers and Sista. Coming to you from Washington, D.C., the tropical Isle of St. Barts, and the Republic of Texas. And be sure to join us next week when we chat about more useless things and explore the crazy shenanigans of our industry. Light Talk, broadcasting questionable Light human Talk. knowledge and humor around the world. We will see you all next Saturday morning. Bye-bye from Light Talk and happy holidays. Light Talk.